talking about Libby Gill, we're going to be here all day. <music> Libby Gill is one of those people who gets it. my process because I think we tend to overcomplicate everything. Clarify, simplify, and execute. This is my decision-making matrix. You plug in the relevant data. You clarify the vision. What is it we are trying to accomplish? You simplify the path. Let's make it clear and simple and take all the extraneous out of the way. And you execute the plan against measurable and specific milestones. After what, uh, what Daily Variety would call a brief stint as an actress, I decided it was time to go behind the camera, behind the scenes and work on the corporate side of entertainment, which turned out to be a much better fit for me, and where my leadership skills, my ability to, to command a room, to lead with vision, to articulate a mission to others, to combine the strategy with the execution, which to me is the art of leadership. Those were skills that found a much better place in that world. So that's what I want to talk about today. Some of the skills that you were hearing before about the strategy, the way that you can create a culture of leadership, because honestly, it's no longer with the kind of things your industry and, and the country, in fact, the world has gone through. It's not enough anymore to just bring out the leadership in yourself. If you are not creating leaders, at all levels of your organization, you're just not fulfilling the obligation of the role. It's not what's in the job description, it's what's not in the description that defines you as a leader. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about some strategies so that you can create that culture of bold leadership around you. First, by developing your own leadership DNA, who you are, sort of the, the who of leadership, Secondly, by a process, the how of leadership, and this is a process that I teach, I've taught across the country, in clarifying, simplifying, and executing a bold vision for success, however you, however you define that success. And then finally, pursuing a radical sense of purpose, of having a real definition for what matters to you, to your constituents, to your customers, your clients, your consumers, but also within your community, your organization, even your own family. So those are the areas I want to touch on today. And first, there's an old saying, you may have heard this before, if you're a leader, if you're leading and no one's following, maybe you're just taking a walk. <laughs> so what you don't want to be is one of those leaders who looks around and discovers there's nobody back there. You want to capture the mind share. And what I mean by that is you've got to get into people's heads and hearts. So you capture the mind share, and then the market share will follow. And capturing the mind share has to do with being able to articulate the value knowing exactly what you bring to the table, being able to pre-sell your ideas, and most of all, having your own personal brand. What do you stand for? What are you known for? What do people assume is going to happen if you bring an idea to the table? And a brand, I do a lot of brand work, and people think it's so mystical, and well, you all know, because most of you are marketers, but a brand is simply the articulation of value. It's how you articulate unique, authentic value across multiple platforms. And then, of course, the accountability part is delivering on that value. You can say it in all sorts of fun and fancy ways with graphic expressions, with words, with sales conversations, not with pitch books, obviously, anymore, but in all these other ways that you want to do it, but then you must deliver upon it. I want to talk a little bit about 
about our own preferences and our own style because we sometimes become slave to our own thoughts and we forget the rest of the world has their preferences too. Let me show you what I mean. Clasp your hands like this right now. Just cross your hands. Now, look down, see if your left thumb is on top or your right thumb, okay? Raise your hand if you're a right thumb on top person. Raise your hand high, okay? Now raise your thumb if you, raise your thumb. <laughs> raise your hand if you're a left thumb on top. We split about 50-50. It, it really doesn't have anything to do with, with hand dominance. Okay, now I want you to switch it. Switch it and put that other thumb on top. Does that feel weird? It's really hard to do. Okay, now try this. Cross your arms. Now some people tuck the hand, some people have it on top. Okay, now leave your arm crossed. Look over at your neighbor, see if they're like you, if they're different from you. Okay. Now, all right, enough. Okay, here's my point. Now what I want you to do, I want you to do, leave your arms crossed. I cross mine now with my left arm on top because I just got engaged, yes, at age 55. Thank you. And I'm so tickled that, you know, I've just got to put my arm on top. Um, anyway, so leave your arms crossed, but nod your head. If you are a right hand on top, nod your head. Okay, now those of you who are left hand on top, nod your head. Okay, now here's what's really interesting. Those of you with the left arm on top, congratulations, because you have the gene for leadership ability. You have a very strong connection. Those of you with the right arm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, there are many other things you can't know. I made that up, of course, okay. You're scientists, I can't outsmart you. All right, these are preferences. These are preferences that we choose early in life and, and they just don't waver too much. But my point is, you're all great leaders, definitely. My point is that our preferences are so strong. We become so wedded to them, it's difficult to change. And the interesting thing is, everybody else's preferences are just that strong. And they're just as resistant to change. They don't want to switch it around either. And to be a leader, you've got to recognize that you've got a room full of people with different strengths, weaknesses, preferences that you've got to meld together into that gumbo. Kaizen is a Japanese phrase. It came out of after World War II when Japan was rebuilding. And kai means to change, and zen is the word that we know, zen for the good. So you put that together and it's, it's incremental change for the good. And on the, the factory floor rooms and in offices, because they were rebuilding really a, a decimated country, there, this philosophy grew up that you must not only do better every day, but you are entrusted, you are encouraged, expected to bring those changes into the workplace and share them with others. And as you're making these changes, you're making a suggestion about the assembly line, it's got to be a holistic approach. So what you do over here that's positive can't negatively affect what's happening over here. And that's the approach that you have to take in your brand. I wish I could tell you it happens overnight. You know, you, you just build it and then you're done. It's like you go to the gym once and then you're done. I wish when somebody comes up with that program, I'm there. But you've got to continue to look down the road and see what your customers are going to need. Anticipate at least three years out. What are they going to need and what are they specifically going to need from you? And then the most important thing you can do is, and you've heard the under-promise and over-deliver, I always think in terms of give them 10 times the value. If they're expecting this, give them 10 times more. Blow their minds with how much value. And this doesn't mean that you can't give free stuff away. I give free stuff away all the time. But as you are giving products, services, you want to give so much value that it's a no-brainer to keep coming back to learn from you because they get that you are sincerely invested in their process. As 
as a leader, when you can bring out the best in people and allow them to be exactly who they are and find the skill and the unique ability in that, then that is gold.